fertility is not what the body is trying to preserve. If you are in a might be killed situation, your body is not like, well, let's drop an egg and hopefully get her knocked up this month. Like, right. no, if the bear is right there, the brain is like pivot, pivot, <laughs> survival and fertility in a lot of ways is not part of the survival plan. There are other more important things, save the brain, work on the muscle, that fast reflexes. It's so the body's like kill digestion, kill fertility. We have to pivot. Carrie Jones, let's talk hormones. I am so excited to have you here today on the Dr. Tina show. You are one of my pandemic besties. You have kept me sane throughout this. I don't think people know our fun meme exchange that we've had going on for years and you are the queen of hormones. And I'm so excited to have you here today. So welcome to my podcast. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh. I was going to say it was the memes that kept us alive. People think it's our immune system or innate immunity. No, it's memes. It was memes that kept us alive. <laughs> I know we had Nicole Jardine, the period girl in there. So we've had a, we've, yeah, we had, we were a triple threat when it came to laughter was the best medicine. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I'm very grateful for that. I hope everybody out there had a mean, mean exchange friendship with somebody through this pandemic. Otherwise I would have gone totally insane. <laughs> Okay. So we're going to talk hormones today. And I'm so glad to have you on because you know that I think nothing works unless your metabolic health is intact. And I'm so tired of hearing influencers on the social medias go on and on about taking this supplement or doing this cleanse or doing this thing to balance your hormones or eating these foods to balance your hormones, but mm -hmm. never addressing the root cause, which is metabolic health. And so I'm hoping we can double down on that today because you know, all things hormones, you educate folks in hormones. You are the medical director for Rupa health. Can you tell me more about that? I know that's a newer situation for you. So update yeah. everybody. Yes. Up to update. So I, for some people who know, some don't, I was the medical director for the Dutch test for nine years. So the Dutch test is a specialty hormone lab. And so I lived, breathed, ate, drank, swam in the realm of hormones. I saw thousands and thousands of lab tests around hormones. I was with them all through the pandemic. So I got to see a lot of cortisol, especially progesterone, testosterone related changes through through the pandemic, I got to hear a lot of, of symptoms, right? My hair is falling out. I can't get pregnant. My brain fog is 10 out of 10, the worst ever. Like, what do you think it could be? And then in January of 2022, I actually switched and I became the head of medical education at Rupa Health. So Rupa is for practitioners. It's a basically one portal to rule them all where you can order multiple labs for one patient or client under one roof. So instead of us practitioners, if I want to get a blood draw, but then I want to do a stool test, but then I want to do saliva or whatever, we would have to go in and out of all these websites to order here, order there, order there. And with Rupa, you could do it under one umbrella, but they brought me in because they were like, we need somebody to sort of collate all the education, create a platform that practitioners could be like, all right, cool. I've got this test, whether it's hormones, whether it's Lyme, whether it's SIBO, whether it's you know, a stool test, genetics test, and then they can learn. They need quick learning and then they need advanced learning. And so it's been wonderful because hormones are my thing, but yet I'm getting the opportunity to talk with all these other experts and learn about all these other areas of health that I would often just refer to, refer off, you know, like Lyme disease, that's not my thing, <laughs> but I, you need help or mold and mycotoxins, super critical. We get this addressed, not my thing though. And so now I get to be, you know, in the trenches, listening to these experts. And it's been horrifying to learn about some, uh, and, but also a pretty amazing at the same time. Yes. I love it. I love it. You are the queen of education. So it's <laughs> awesome. And I'm glad to have you on here. You know, speaking of all those other conditions, I often think it's, it still brings me back to being harder to kill because or making yourself harder to kill, because I always say to my colleagues who are mold experts, I'm like, where does mold grow? it grows in damp, stagnant places. Yeah. Right. And so we've got these folks who are, and I get it. I've been super sick before and I understand how hard it is to get up off your ass and get going. But when you are stagnant and you don't have good metabolism, that's revving and you don't have good muscle mass, you can't fight off the mold. Yeah. Right. Your immune or system anything. can't for anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, but we're going to talk about hormones. So you and I off the air, we're just talking about progesterone that's a big one. I've never seen progesterone actually. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen progesterone normal on a lab. I've always seen it low. So let's talk about 
how frequent that is. Is that just my practice or is that normal? And that, or I shouldn't say normal. Is that common? common. Yeah. And is what's going on there? Yeah. So progesterone, this is, so this is one of the things that we are actually saying off air. And I say it a lot hormones there for those of us who are our age and are familiar hormones are like Mariah Carey. Like they're very dramatic and they react to everything. They're the canary in the coal mine. So they are not they, well, they may be the cause of some of your symptoms, whether it's related to PMS or fertility or hot flashes or hair loss or weight gain or whatever, they're not the ultimate cause. It's not the lack of progesterone. It's like, what is causing your lack of progesterone? So progesterone is a progestation hormone, meaning it is the hormone responsible for making your uterus plush and cozy and ready for implantation. It's the hormone that brings in the throw pillows and the snuggly blankets and the fireplace and is like, all right, let's implant and like, let's be cozy and hang out in here. But it's also the hormone that's really helpful for sleep and it reduces anxiety. I mean, it has calming aspects to it as well when it breaks down. So we really like our progesterone and we, as when you are a cycling female, you make boatloads of it, but only after you ovulate. So once you release the egg, then you have these little cells that the brain says, all right, switch tactics and start pumping out progesterone. But because hormones are very dramatic, any little thing can screw this up. Whether the brain doesn't fully tell those little cells make progesterone or the little cells themselves are not that healthy. So they just, they're like a really poorly functioning factory. So you could have an elite factory making a lot of progesterone or that like really poorly functioning crappy factory that's just pumping out a little bit. And then as a result, you have lower progesterone. And when you have lower progesterone, you don't feel good. Your PMS is worse. You tend to have water retention. You're, you know, it's more prone to headaches. You're more prone to insomnia. Fertility chances go down. Like there's a lot that goes around progesterone. So in, as I said, a lot can get in the way of progesterone because remember, and you're in your whole harder to kill fertility is not what the body is trying to preserve. If you are in a might be killed situation, your body is not like, well, let's drop an egg and hopefully get her knocked up this month. Like, right. no, you, you know, like if the bear is right there, the brain is like pivot, <laughs> pivot <laughs> survival and fertility in a lot of ways is not part of the survival plan. There are other more important things, save the brain, work on the muscle that, you know, fast reflexes is so the body's like kill digestion, kill fertility. We have to pivot. And so nowadays in your, when you were in practice, when I was in practice in the last couple of years, we're seeing, I feel like we're seeing this drop in progesterone, whether it's just, it's being released, but not what it should, or just not at all, because there's just so much going on that the body's like pivot. We're in survival right now, pivot. This is not really going to work. So our progesterone drops down. So what I was seeing in practice was basically a lot of poor health. Yeah. At the end of the day. Yeah. Cause you can only, I'm making the analogy simple, but like, if you are in a lot of pain, if you are in with a lot of inflammation, if you are fighting, if you are living in a mold riddled house and just don't either know it, or you don't know it, then the body, the amount of effort that goes into keep getting you upright and getting you going and circulating and, you know, oxygen and mitochondria takes a lot. It takes a lot. That takes a lot. And so what falls by the wayside, like I said, is fertility. So the body's going to focus more resources on the day-to-day hopefully functioning and less on the fertility aspect. Now, one of the pushbacks I will get, and I understand why is like, well, Carrie, you can't make everything around fertility. Not everybody wants to get pregnant. I'm like, absolutely. I don't want to get pregnant. I still have regular cycles. And I'm like, hell no, I don't want to get pregnant. But my being female with ovaries and uterus, my body is like, Hey, every single month you have this potential. And so even though I don't want to be pregnant, I do want healthy progesterone. I do want to sleep at night. I'd like to be calm. I don't want PMS, right? Like I, I don't want water retention. So I don't want the downside effects. Now, there are a lot of women who do want to be pregnant, but there's a mix. It's 50-50, but it doesn't matter. In the end, the act of reproduction or fertility is what the female body, if you still have ovaries, is sort of putting at the center. And so if you have a lot of internal or external factors getting in the way of that, then you're going to feel all those symptoms because your hormones are getting disrupted. Right. And it, if the pandemic hasn't shown us anything else, it's that 
biology doesn't care about your feelings. <laughs> not a little bit. So not wanting to get <laughs> or pregnant. What's fair, or what's fair, the body does not care what's fair. <laughs> no, no. So it doesn't matter if you want to get pregnant or not. We need to live in a way that is optimizing to our genetically given hormones. And yeah. I mean, that's, that's how you feel best is all. If you're a man doing the things that stoke testosterone in a healthy way. And if you're a woman doing the things that keep your progesterone and estrogen happy, yep. it's key. It's so. all part of the bigger spider web. Like we want all of our hormones through the whole body to be healthy. Like I would like my thyroid to be as healthy as my glucose and insulin as healthy as my prolactin, as healthy as my estrogen, my progesterone, my testosterone, my cortisol, et cetera, et cetera. It's if it, it like a spider web, if I were to pluck one end of the spider web, we know the whole thing vibrates. It's the same thing in the body. If one area or aspect is off, then everybody else feels it. If my glucose and insulin are terrible, they're high, I'm not metabolically healthy. Or if my thyroid is low, so I'm not functioning well, if my prolactin is high, which is another hormone that can affect our cycle and, you know, our hormones, et cetera, it doesn't, it, nothing works in a silo, right? It's not like just the thyroid is over here. I'm only going to address the thyroid. The thyroid touches pretty much every cell in the whole body, every system in the whole body, glucose and insulin or our blood sugar, every cell in the body, every cell in the body. It's not like oh, I'm just, you know, micro focusing in on glucose. It's like, no, you, you have, we have receptors everywhere. Even in the ovaries, we have, we have receptors for this. You better believe insulin gets in there and can impact if, especially if it's high. We have, Houston, we have a problem. Yeah. People don't realize that insulin gets inside your joints and creates all kinds of havoc. Yeah. And it's yeah. like, no, this isn't just, nothing is working in isolation. It's like yes. you said, it's all one big web or yeah. I think of it as a wheel, you know, with spokes yeah. that are different lengths or whatever it's, and it's not even that clean cut. It's, it, it, we don't even understand it completely. <laughs> oh my gosh, the majority of the body, we don't understand. Like we understand a lot, but how much has come out in the last year or two mm -hmm. in these new quote, new quote frontiers, like how much have we learned about the microbiome? We know the very tip of the iceberg when it comes to the microbiome, we think we know a lot, or you'll see quote, influencers on social media who are like, oh my gosh, here's the gold standard on the microbiome. Like, absolutely not. There is so much we are, the amount of literature coming out of the microbiome, we can't keep up with it. Like we cannot keep it, it just too much. There's remember, remember when they called us naturopathic doctors quacks for focusing on the gut and saying that yeah. all health and disease started and ended in the gut. And they were like, leaky gut isn't real. Yep. <laughs> and now the amount of literature on like zonulin and uh, this all the tight junctions and the enzymes that go into that. It's like, oh, and big name journals too. Not even weird one-off journals they can make fun of like actual front page, big name journals. I'm like, man, we had to get thick skin in this industry. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. It's hard being right. It's, <laughs> it's hard being right. I love it. It's hard being right. You're right. Let you mentioned mitochondria and I, yeah. without getting too technical because my audience is of diverse crowd of, yep. and I do try to keep it high level. So keep it high level. But okay. you one time years ago said to me that your hormones are made in your mitochondria. And I like freaked out and didn't understand what you were saying. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to go look at it. Can you please explain that in the yeah. most simplistic terms? What yeah. do you mean by that? So we all learned in school that the mitochondria were the our powerhouses, right? They made our energy, our ATP, but it turns out our mitochondria are like super multi-talented. They do a lot of things. One of the things they do is they make our steroid hormones. So in our mitochondria, when you need to make, when, a, when you or I or our partners need to make a testosterone, then what happens is it gets the signal, the mitochondria in that organ. So for us, maybe in our ovaries and for men in their testicles, they'll get the signal it goes down to the mitochondria and that's where the magic starts happening. So your cholesterol turns into something called pregnenolone in the mitochondria. And then, so that's the first step. So the very first step of hormone production, steroid hormone production, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA are in the mitochondria. So now you've made pregnenolone, pregnenolone leaves and goes next door to its buddy called the endoplasmic reticulum and finishes out as estrogen or, well, you have three estrogens, but one of them, progesterone, testosterone, DHEA, cortisol, cortisol actually comes back. Cortisol turns into something called 11-deoxycortisol. 
and then comes back into the mitochondria and finishes out as cortisol. So any cortisol you make or don't make, maybe you've done a cortisol test and it's really low. Everyone blames the adrenals, which is high level true. That's where your cortisol is made. But down at the like microscopic level, it's the first and last step of cortisol production is the mitochondria. So while we learn as energy production, it's the powerhouse. It is also the powerhouse for the production, the first step of our hormones. So if we are not making progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, cortisol, et cetera, et cetera, the mitochondria in that gland are probably either not healthy themselves or not getting the signal for some reason to become a factory and turn it on. So mitochondrial health is critically important. And they're bacterium. They're bacterium. Yes. That's what and people they, don't get. They poison them with all the things. And I'm like, yeah. like the glyphosates and the yeah. you know, fluoroquinolones. And I'm you like, you think hormones are dramatic like Mariah Carey? Mitochondria are 10 <laughs> dramatic. Like they will literally, they will faint at the sight of anything. Medications they don't like. Mo you can look up online pharmacy groups, real pharmacy groups will pull together lists. Here are all the medications that are detrimental to mitochondria. You can go look it up. Rite Aid, Walgreens, Kroger, Fred Meyer Pharmacy, they all have it if you just you just Google it. And they'll come up with a list of medications that were, are very destructive to the mitochondria. This is well known. Chemicals, toxicants. These are uh, mitochondria. They're very fragile. They're very sensitive. They don't want to be around toxicants. They don't want to be around chemicals. They don't want alcohol because it, it really affects them negatively. Yes. And we well, feel they're, they're, it. Our, they're down, our downstream symptoms are this, our hormonal symptoms, our energy symptoms, right? Our immune symptoms, because they're getting so affected. Because they're sensors. They are. They are truly the canary in the coal mine. Yeah. Yeah. They're yeah. sensors. And that's, they, they sense light. I believe they photosynthesize. There's some literature on that. Like they're just sensors. The, the cytochrome, um, my, oh, hold on. Let me, let me pull out physiology from my brain. This cytochrome C. So mitochondria think of like a conveyor belt, right? And so you have, they move in, they move from one section to the next. And then at the end result, when you go through this whole conveyor belt is you make poof ATP. And so in one of the sections of the photos, the red light, so sunlight, they, and as a photoreceptor, that's the word I was looking for. It has a photo, it has a legitimate photoreceptor. So not only does it need oxygen, there's actually a convert, there's, you need oxygen as part of your mitochondria. You actually do need like sunlight exposure as well to help them. They have this all built in. And so people, people, you know, especially conventional medicine practitioners would make fun of me or would be like, that's not true. I'm like, I'm literally just repeating basic physiology. It's like basic physiology in the textbooks. I am not making this up. I am not wishful thinking. Like I am just pulling it out of your basic textbooks of look, here's where oxygen is important in this step. Look, here's where, you know, the photoreceptor is in this step in the mitochondria. And so when somebody is like, well, everyone breathes, we're all human. I'm like, unless you have sleep apnea, unless you're snoring at night, unless you mouth breathe, yes, you're getting oxygen in, but not at hundred percent or, you know, 98%. It's down from that. So any little percentage drop down and the brain freaks out, the body freaks out. So if you sleep apnea, if you're snoring, if you're a mouth breather, then you're not getting that high nineties percent that you need all the time. And so now you get what we call like a hypo hypoxemic state to some degree. So the brain, everybody freaks, the mitochondria, like everyone freaks out. And, but it gets blown off. Oh, snoring's so common. It's not a big deal. Sleep apnea. That's so common. It's okay. It's like, it's mild carry. I'm like, well, they don't have mild symptoms. They feel like crap. So let's address it. That's like mild myocarditis. My, <laughs> I shouldn't my, laugh. Mild I'm, pregnancy. I'm, like if we, with, you know, like I'm kind of pregnant. I'm like, there's no kind of, you either are or aren't. You know? <laughs> I wonder what masks are doing to mitochondria. I, then that will never be studied. Not right. that will never be studied, but it's a really good question. I saw it get asked a lot on social media. What are masks doing to oxygenation and subsequently the downstream effects? And I was like, yeah, it's a really so good question. If your mitochondria are off, what you're what I'm hearing you say is that your hormones will be off because yes. your hormones and remember actually... mitochondria are located all over the body. So I have had people say, well, that's not possible because, you know, mitochondria are everywhere. And I'm like, ah, ah, but in each gland is where it's important. So you can have mitochondrial dysfunction 
in the testicles is of a man and testosterone production is hard. You can have mitochondrial dysfunction in the ovaries and the act of ovulation is tough for you. Making progesterone is tough for you. You can have it in the adrenal, you can have it in your muscles. Like it doesn't have to be all or nothing. It's not an all or nothing thing with mitochondria. It can be in areas of the body where it's, where there's, it's problematic. That is, yeah, that's fascinating. So it all comes down to, at the end of the day, it all comes down to mitochondrial function and that, yeah, I heard somebody say years ago at a ozone conference, he said, how do you know if someone has adrenal dysfunction and people shouted out answers and he said, because they're in your office. And then he said, how do you know if somebody has mitochondrial dysfunction? And everyone shouted out answers, but nobody was really talking about mitochondria back then. And he said, because they're presenting with adrenal issues. So like, that's it. If the symptoms of fatigue are there, if, you know, any of these common symptoms of adrenal dysfunction, you're probably looking more critically at the root at some kind of mitochondrial dysfunction, you know? So I'll just tell the audience, Carrie calls me the Oracle. (laughs) I I totally call you the Oracle. I I should have written down everything you predicted just in a list and then just checked it off as we went through. We could go back to our text thread. I (laughs) wrote a paper in undergrad about mitochondria because I thought I was so blown away that they were bacterium and I wrote a whole paper about it Mm -hmm. and I was so excited. And I think I was, I think I was prefacing. And then I wrote a paper in, gosh, what was it? Oh, I was in 12th grade. I was in senior year and in AP calculus and we had to write a paper and everybody was writing these boring, just boring papers. (laughs) They were interviewing, everybody was interviewing architects or engineers and writing boring papers. And he gave us an exam. It was like our big year long project. And I'm looking at all these papers and I'm like, oh, this is so snore worthy. It's so boring. I can't do it. And I went and interviewed my chiropractor about the, you know, the little, what's it called? The activator. Activator. Yeah. And vectors and force and vectors. And that was what my final senior project in AP calculus was on. So I think I was foreshadowing my trajectory somewhere down this line. Anyway. uh, Okay. So you mentioned cortisol and it obviously is critical to you that we have good mitochondrial health. If we want our cortisol to be happy, people's cortisol is wrecked. What were you seeing? Can you share what you were seeing during the pandemic? coming down the chute with people's cortisol. Cause I know they didn't go into it probably in stellar condition. I can't imagine what it's like this many years later. Yeah. So a lot of just from anecdotal observation, a lot of people, why are people doing the test in the first place? Cause they feel terrible, right? They feel pretty terrible. So we saw what we call a lot of rhythm dysfunctions. So can you produce cortisol in the first place? Like, does your brain actually communicate down to the adrenal glands and say, okay, go, wait, don't go. Okay. Go now. Okay. Is that communication there? And then can the adrenal glands, which is ultimately the mitochondria, can they do their job of producing cortisol at the right amount? So in an ideal person, you should wake up in the morning and within 30 minutes, 30 to 45 minutes, you will produce a boatload of cortisol. It's normal and natural. People freak out. Ah, Carrie, I thought high cortisol was bad and it causes weight gain. This rise in cortisol is called the cortisol awakening response. It's very important to getting you up in the morning, getting your immune system ready, reducing inflammation, giving you a little bit of glucose because you've been fasting all night, getting your butt out of bed, et cetera, et cetera. And then it drops down the rest of the day. It's nice and low at night. So your cortisol is like the sun. It goes up in the morning and then it's like the moon at night. It goes down at night and then you have melatonin comes out with the moon. So cortisol is the sun, melatonin is the moon. So that's your rhythm, high in the morning, low at night. But a lot of people had a reverse curve. They're low in the morning, they're tired, they're living on caffeine, they're hitting snooze, they're hating life. And then at night, they can't sleep, can't sleep, can't sleep, can't sleep, can't sleep. They get their second wind. They're up watching Netflix. They're drinking wine. They're on their phone. They're scrolling social media. They're working because their kids are now in bed and they have the time. And then they just repeat the process over and over and over again. Now you throw a pandemic on top of that. And it just exponentially got worse because not only if you, especially in the first wave like the pre-shot people. So you actually got sick. You got hit with that first, the first strain. Their cortisol, of course, just went crazy because it was trying to help. We saw a lot of like really high cortisols. And I'm like, this is good. People freak out. Oh my gosh, my cortisol is high. No, it's doing its job. High, it's, it's anti-inflammatory to a point. It's trying to help you and help your immune system like fight, fight and then recover. That's what its job is. Now, unfortunately though, and what can happen as we saw over time is that 
if that signal from the brain down to the adrenal glands gets dysregulated, then you're not going to produce cortisol at the right time, or it would be kind of low all the time. On the flip side, if you're always infected and inflamed, then you can have higher cortisol, high cortisol for longer periods of time. And then eventually the body is like, this sucks. And it will dial down your cortisol and you will drop low. So you can go from sort of dysfunctional to low or dysfunctional to high to low. So we would see these patterns as people would test, test, test. And what really gave me a lot of hope initially was like the body was trying. The body was really trying. The body was like, we're going to jack up cortisol because we're going to like throw everything we can at this massive fire and try to anti-inflammatory our way out of it. But as, as everything progressed and the stress was high, people were at home, diets went out the window, alcohol consumption went up, exercise went down, mental, emotional trauma was real. Then the body, you can only do so much. And when you were three years in, and so the poor HPA, which is, we call the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal. So our cortisol access after three years, like it's taken a heck of a beating. And so now what do we see? Now we see a lot of people who are always on edge, anxiety, insomnia, brain fog. Like they just don't have the oomph. Their energy's lower. A lot of people I talk to are like, I drink a lot more caffeine than I used to. You know, I'm like, I know I mean, you're trying to replace something that three years ago was kind of struggling, doing its best. You could get by and then it just completely collapsed. And, and I would say that for obviously not all the people, a lot of people came through and listened to you and got harder to kill and started worked out at home and like addressed their metabolic health, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And are doing quite fine. But unfortunately, as we saw, a lot of people are not a lot of people I talk to because I travel a lot for work. So inevitably it's like, what do you do for a living? I'm a doctor. What kind of doctor? I'm into hormones. They, they, without even asking, like, do you mind if I ask you a question? They're immediately like, I feel like crap. I'm so tired all the time. My hormones suck. Like, it's just this verbal vomit of like, what can you do? What can I do? Just please save me. This has been a hard three years. And I'm like, I know, I know cortisol is, it's you, that system has taken quite the beating. You think the immune system has taken the beating? The adrenal cortisol system has taken it as well. And that impact, I mean, that's what people that's what I was trying to get across at the very, very beginning about getting your blood sugars in order, because that stressor of getting infected raises your blood sugar levels. That's why when I look at my continuous glucose monitor that I use, I have one from NutriSense. And I, mm -hmm. sometimes when I have crazy dreams, my glucose will shoot up in the middle of the night. And that is in my opinion, probably oh. coming from a cortisol surge. Let me explain this. Yes. I, this is good. So cortisol's main job, everyone thinks it's energy. It's going to give you energy. It, you know, it helps deal with stress. Yes. It's blood sugar. So cortisol is under an umbrella family called a quarter gluco cortico steroid. That's its umbrella family. Gluco cortico steroid. Why is gluco its first name? Because glucose is what it gives the body. Cortisol's main job is to go up when you have any kind of stress or threat and increase glucose in your system. Whether it's a stressful text message, you're literally sitting your butt on the couch and it's just a stress mess or text message that you don't like, or you're in a physical fight with a bear, it doesn't matter. Your body reads the same thing and says, raise glucose because I have to get this to the brain for survival. That's its primary job in life. The problem is we don't fight bears anymore. Literally, we don't actually fight, but we do have a lot of stress sitting on our butt in front of our computers at work on the couch, et cetera, et cetera. So I was in the car. I had a continuous glucose monitor on last year. I was in my car. I had gotten a unfriendly text message as I was walking out the door to go run errands and I was pissed and I get in my car and I'm verbally yelling in my car as I'm driving to run errands for about 20 minutes. And I'm like, I, I have the snap on, like I was pissed as I was talking to myself in the car to call my, like, not well to like amp myself up and then calm myself down before I texted the person back. When I got to the destination, I scanned my glucose and I was 30 points higher, yep. 30 points. Yep. And I scanned it in the house, like just prior, like, you know, cause it keeps a record. So I knew what my fasting was totally normal. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I was mad. My body thought I was fighting a bear in my car and re reacted 
normally. Oh my gosh, Carrie's mad. She's fighting. Give her glucose. Let's give her glucose. Yep. So she can go to her brain. And then we're going to, it makes our skeletal muscles not accept or yeah, not accept a lot of glucose so that we, again, like it's prepping us to fight. And so I was like, dang, what a very, I learned a lot. Yeah. It's your emotions. I think and I have pretty good metabolic health. And I was like, well, not when I, my body thinks I'm fighting a bear in the car for 20 minutes. Exactly. And we fight bears all day long. I know people listening to this are like, my job is 10 out of 10 stressful. My kids are 10 out of 10 stressful. My ex is 10 out of 10 stressful. My what, you know, like whatever. I you just see it all over social media of people upset, stressed out, burned out at their max constantly. So even if you're like, I'm eating a super clean diet, I am trying to exercise, I'm trying to go to bed on time. We're just fragile folk right now. We are fragile folk right now. Right. That's why I was trying to get everybody to understand that and lift weights because it was like, create the mop. The muscle is the mop. Yep. Create the mop because we can't control the fact that the media is twisting everything up, but we can't control the fear factory that they keep shoving down our throats, especially in the beginning, there was so much fear. And I knew that's what was happening to people's blood sugars. And I knew from the data that those going into hospital were already going into a diabetic state, even if they weren't diabetic, just transient because right. of the infection. That's, it also happens when you get hit with some kind of infectious organism or something that's taxing your system. And I was like, we can't control all those variables, but we can control the mop. Yeah. Right. So like build yeah. the mop people quickly. Yeah. <laughs> that, think- that's why I was so fervent about it. Cause I'm yeah. like, people don't realize what you just said is so true. And I had the same thing, like going to the airport, just getting in my car to go to the airport, knowing I had like a three hour journey ahead of me blood sugar skyrockets, getting into the Uber when I'm late for the dinner, blood sugar skyrockets. It's a normal response to the body in a healthy person. Again, the body thinks you're fighting the bear. It's going to raise your glucose to very straight. Now what's healthy, helpful, good, and a metabolically sound person is that it will drop back down. We will have the skeletal muscle. We will have the slab of lean muscle on us that act that will then suck up all that glucose. Our glucose, our insulin receptors were called sensitive. So they're like super receptive key and lock fits. Perfect. Turns the lock. No problem. Glucose gets pulled out of the bloodstream and then used by that slab of muscle. So while it does go up, we have the built-in health factors to bring it back down relatively quickly and balance back out. And so hundred, but a lot of people don't. A lot of people don't, they're stressed all day long. And then their poor little insulin receptors are like, like we've all had those old locks where we're like, no, you have to push the key in just halfway and then kind of turn it. And then the rest, and then it will open. You're like, we've all had for whatever reason, whether it's a house lock, like just jiggle it. It'll be fine. Think of that in your body, your insulin receptors. And if your body's constantly like trying to jiggle a receptor, then glucose doesn't get in the cell to be used up, so to speak. And so we, so while, cause I would get asked, oh my gosh, are you so worried that your blood sugar shot up 30 points? I'm like, no, because it will go back down. It's a normal, natural response for me. And I had the built-in rescue system to like pull my glucose back down. So it wouldn't stay high forever and ever the way yes. that I eat, the way that I exercise sleep. Now, can I have bad days? A hundred percent, even just not sleeping. We all know if you don't sleep very well, or you have to get up really early for work. Or, I mean, we've all had to get up super early for something, a procedure, the airport, our kid. And then what happens the next day? We're hungry. We're moody. We're like, why? I'm like, why am I so freaking hungry? It's because our appetite suppressant gets completely thrown off when we don't sleep. The way we regulate blood sugar and insulin gets completely thrown off when we don't sleep very well. It, it was wild to watch it on my NutriSense monitor because it would just the next day after a disrupted night of sleep, yes. like I was at a conference yeah. and I didn't sleep good the whole time. Of course. Okay. Yep. And the, those next days were so brittle. My blood yeah. sugar was so brittle to everything. And so even something like beef, which normally doesn't even cause a peak would If there was even any carbohydrates, it would, I would have more of a robust response. And so that sleep factor, so key to what's going to happen for you the next day with your blood sugar regulation and your blood sugar regulation and your body having control of that is so key to your hormones and how your immune system is going to function. And so it's all, like you said, there, we go back to the spider web. 
Yeah. And then people are like, well, we're brittle and sensitive and Mariah Carey and notice respect to Mariah Carey. I'm a, I'll be honest. I am a huge Mariah Carey fan. I think she is a good singer and highly entertaining, but like, we all can agree. She is dramatic. If even you get affected, Tina, if you get affected, like, what do we do? I'm like, we keep doing what we're doing. Like when I'm at a con- I was at a conference last weekend and same thing. I slept like crap. I didn't drink at all, but didn't matter. I was a time zone off. Didn't sleep that well. And I would wake up starving with a capital S and I'm not usually, I don't usually wake up starving, but I am a big believer in like, well, if I'm just go eat. Like, why would I force myself to quote fast, which will drive up my cortisol, which will piss off the rest of my body. And since they serve breakfast, you know, instead of going for the muffins and the carbs and all the things I had eggs and I had the turkey sausage and I had a piece of bacon. Like I just went all protein. And then I had, I got a plate of berries and just waited, you know, a little bit then had some berries. And so I, I just thought it, I knew it was happening and thought it through and was just smart about it. But I know a lot of people woke up starving and were like right to the cart, like right to the blueberry muffins, right to the croissants, because they're like, oh, I'm at a conference. I'm going to treat myself. I'm hungry. I didn't sleep well last night. And I get it. But at the same time, that's only going to make the snowball worse. And like the whole, like, you know, I'm like, I didn't drink. I don't drink a lot to begin with, but I was out to dinner with some big folks in our field who all drank. And I was like, I'll just have sparkling water. Cause I know if I drink alcohol, it's going to screw up my sleep even more, which will just wreck my metabolism even more and my immune system, it's not worth it. And I've already been flying and it's conference season. So you just protect, you just keep doing what you're doing and protect what you can. Yeah. That, that brings me to a question I had to address on this podcast. So one of the reasons I quit drinking was because I would text Carrie every few months <laughs> having some kind of horrible PMS. And usually it was breast tenderness that was like out of control. And it was getting progressively worse as I aged, of course. And I would say, well, what about this? And what about that? And I'm smart and she's smart. And I would try to do what everyone else does. It's the what about isms, which drive me insane on Instagram when people are like, but they want some kind, the what about isms are just people asking for some kind of special situation just for them (laughs) where the rules don't apply. And (laughs) you always would text back and be like, Tina, it's the wine. (laughs) <laughs> which sucks because you live in country like you were surrounded by wonderful wineries and I didn't drink that much like yeah. every time I tell like even my husband he can't stop teasing me because I'm a classic lightweight I mean classic like I'm a classic lightweight and when I would tell anybody that knows me or has seen me drink they're like dude you can't drink you're not very good at it and I'm like I know but just that small slow drip yeah. was just utter poison. And I think it was, you know, that it's the bucket analogy. The bucket was over full and that was not serving me. So I gave it up and I I have to give you a lot of credit because I can't tell you how many times I was texting you and you would answer me and I'd be like, damn it. (laughs) (laughs) It has to be this other thing. And then you did a great reel about it where you talked about detoxing your estrogen and how alcohol interferes with that. Can you just quickly cover that? So alcohol is a bully, whereas obviously I'm, I am dramatic in my analogies. So alcohol is a bully. And so she will push herself to the front of the line when it comes to liver detoxification. So if you are trying to process toxic chemicals, estrogen, whatever, everything goes to the liver alcohol in my experience and feeling pushes herself to the front. And then alcohol, when it breaks down, actually becomes more toxic. It has to turn into something more toxic for a little bit before the body can then untoxify it and get it out of your system. So you go from toxic to more toxic, like really more toxic, and then not toxic and out of the body. So now you have this alcohol going to the liver that's toxic to begin with, becoming more toxic, and then pushing estrogen to the back. So now estrogen's like, well, screw you and goes back out in circulation. And in Dr. Tina's case, it went right, right, right back to her breast tissue and cause breast pain for others of us. It'll go to our fat tissue or it'll go to whatever other places it'll cause PMS type symptoms or super heavy. It'll go to the uterus. And now we'll have heavy periods and heavy clots and in cramps because estrogen can increase things like histamine, which can cause high levels of cramps or worse than endometriosis. And if you cut out the bully, if you cut out the alcohol, then estrogen can properly file through the liver appropriately, hopefully, and get out of the system. And yes, it's true when you detoxify estrogen or any of these other chemicals, they do go to a more toxic version first before they become a no toxic version. 
but alcohol seems to top a lot of that. It's definitely in the, like the most, when I think of more, more toxic intermediaries is what we call it. Alcohol is quite up there. And again, I'm saying this as somebody who does like the occasional drink, like a good quality. I'm a bubbles person. So like champagne, a good dry champagne. Like why do all the bad things have to, good things have to be so bad for us? <laughs> I love a glass of champagne, but I would have these, I would have, when I was in my thirties in practice, I had all these women in their forties and fifties and they would go, you wait, Carrie, you wait <laughs> yeah. you get 40s in your forties, you won't be able to drink like you used to, and you won't be able to sleep anymore. And I was like, oh, that's cute. Right. I went to school for this. No, they were right. As you have said, right from the beginning, like physiology does not care and physiology doesn't care about your feelings or what's fair. And so I hit my forties and I definitely sometimes struggle with sleep and I definitely cannot drink alcohol like I used to. So I've just largely given it up. Yeah. It's, it doesn't serve me. It's not my friend. One of my best friends, Dr. Ralph Esposito got married and he's Italian New Yorker. And he was like, bring your drinking shoes. Cause the amount of alcohol at our wedding is going to be insanity. I had a pep talk with my liver. I was like, we've done this. We went through college. You've done spring breaks. Like you can do this. And no, <laughs> and I even did all the, bi- I brought like all the biohacky things to help with my liver process. It was super amazing, fun wedding, but I was very careful in my alcohol because I knew I would just feel like crap. Oh, it's not even a question for me anymore. And that's okay. I think I just had to realize that it was kind of like when I gave up gluten years ago, I was like, this is not helping me. And people want to apply emotions to these things, but it's like, if it's not serving your body, then that's it. And when I quit drinking, it was remarkable. And I had some really pro, I mean, each month was better than the last and by month, I mean, it's. I did drink a few days while I was in Mexico in May, but I, I quit in January of 2022, January 1st. And then I drank a few days in May. That was a terrible idea. I felt terrible, terrible, like don't want to revisit that terrible. And then I haven't touched it since. And I'm okay with that, but it's different for everyone. And the thing that kept coming back was people were like, well, if you barely drank and you had you or no, I'm sorry, I back up. They would say you must have been drinking heavily if you yeah. had that profound of a response. And I'm like, no, I'm just at the right age. Like you just yeah. nailed it. I'm just yeah. at that age where I used to kind of snicker at my patients too. I'd be like, ha ha, sucks for you. Cause I was in my thirties <laughs> and I could eat and drink anything and have a six pack. And here I am now almost 50 and it's a whole different story. So I was like, it was the whole hormonal thing. Yeah. It was the whole perimenopause hormonal sort of milieu that was just sitting right at that spot for me. And I think it was the, I think it was the consistency of the slow drip Yeah, that was really profound. And so removing that slow drip of poison, my aura ring, which, you know, you pointed me up towards as well, the, it doesn't lie. I mean, yeah. my deep sleep was destroyed Crap. by alcohol and my yeah. deep sleep is remarkable. And my heart rate variability is so beautiful now. It every month it gets better. Nice. It was in the twenties in January. It had been in the twenties and thirties for years, like generally speaking. And now it's in the forties and fifties. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's like each month I get better. And I think I'm just, I have consistently drank since I was 14 years old, consistently, like very consistently consumed low amounts of alcohol since I was 14 years old, big drinking background with where I grew up, that was what they did and big drinking in college, big drinking in chiropractic college. And for me, big drinking isn't very big because <laughs> I throw up before I get too far. I just automatically, like my body says expel, but <laughs> it really yeah. does. I think at this point it's coming down to like, what's my, t- and I also have the MTHFR mutations, the homozygous, like I'm, I don't That's, detox. Yeah. yeah. I don't detox well. So it's like, for me, it was kind of a, I'll tell you what it was more than anything was after COVID. I had some COVID brain and match that with perimenopausal brain and match that with inability to detox anything brain. And I was losing my wit and my sharp, like I really pride myself on my wits and yeah. I was not thinking quickly and things weren't coming to me quickly. And I was having a hard time with numbers and I was like, oh, hell no, yeah. this is, I'm not losing. This was a very expensive brain that I had take a lot of pride in. <laughs> Yeah. I should probably stop destroying it with alcohol <laughs> and needs, a, needs to hang around a whole lot longer. You say the slow drip. And I think the slow drip applies to everything. At this last conference was a microbiome conference. And they were, there was a speaker talking about the inflammation from our gut that goes up to our brain. And he was talking about all kinds of inflammation. And what people don't realize 
is that if you know a certain food, let's say dairy is a problem for you, but you can't give up cheese. And you're like, well, I only eat it a couple times a week. You know, like I eat it here and there, but I know when I eat it, I don't feel good or I get diarrhea or I'm blo- I have gas or whatever. But because, you know, if you're like, I only eat it three times a week, so it's not that big of a deal. But again, it's that slow drip because it can take it just because you, when you eat it on Monday and then you eat it again on Wednesday and then you eat it again on Saturday and you get them, it's not just that day. It takes 48 to 72 hours for the body to like process it, which people don't understand. So it's just this constant, you're just constantly putting it into the body, the slow drip, yeah. as you say. And so then when you cut it out and you think, I didn't even eat that much cheese. God, I feel so much better. I didn't even eat that much cheese, but you slow dripped it three to four times a week. And there you go. That was the problem, which is again, not fair or fun, but the body doesn't care about your feelings or what's fair. I love that so much. <laughs> Whereas then somebody else will say I eat cheese every day. And so you look at them and you're like, well, you're a problem because you're every day. I'm only three times a week. So I'm okay. But yes. You're not. That is but. it. Right. That's what people, they really want to justify. I saw it with patients. I see it with followers online. They really want to justify their habits. And so they're yeah. like, well, if Dr. Tina does this, then it gives me permission to do this. Right. And they're still yeah. asking me, they still drop into my comments. They're like, are you still not drinking? And I'm like, why are you so interested? Yeah. Does that help you justify your drinking habit? Yeah. You know, I mean, just and, to be frank, that's yeah. what it is. It's like, they want to feel better about their habits of all sorts. So long as their favorite influencer. And I love my followers. I don't mean any disrespect, but it's like, we got to own our own shit. Yep. And oh. my shit is different than your shit. <laughs> alcohol is a hard one though, right? Alcohol, alcohol is a hard one. Our trash and recycling comes in our neighborhood on Friday morning. So everybody puts it out Thursday night because I have a dog with a lot of energy, we walk our dog a lot. So after dinner, we take our dog on a walk. And by then most of our neighbors have put out their trash and recycling. And before COVID, not to be nosy, I just walk my dog every single day. So with recycling, I would notice what people have in there. We have these recycle bins. They're like low plastic containers, not like an actual trash can. So you can see what everybody puts in the recycle bin and you're just walking by it with your dog. Well, when COVID hit, I was, I know what my neighborhood's doing to relax. I mean, everyone's glass container bin was overflowing and it wasn't with sparkling water, you know, it wasn't with <laughs> glass of bottles of kombucha. I tell you that it was wine and vodka and whiskey. I mean, it was liquor bottles and wine bottles and beer bottles in their glass container. And it lasted, I mean, years. And I understand people have to do what they do, have need to do to cope. But I also know being in practice as long as I was that until sometimes people just don't realize it's a problem. I had a really neat woman who was turning 40 weight loss was her big thing. She couldn't lose weight. And then I think anxiety was another thing. When I asked her about alcohol, she had a bottle of red wine a night, every single night, seven days a week, a bottle of red wine. And she had this really neat job and she had like really active kids. And so it was very social and it was relaxing. It's what she and her husband did, but she had her own bottle. And so I was like, you drink up seven bottles a week. And it, she, at first she was like, yeah, which is not that much. You should see what my friends drink. You should see what my husband's drink. You should see what happens at these events I have to go to for work. And then when I saw her again, because we did blood work and stuff. And so she came back for her follow-up. She goes, oh my gosh, I stopped drinking completely. Went from seven bottles a week to none. She said, it didn't even dawn on me that a bottle a, week, a night was a problem until you were like, are you sure you mean seven bottles a night? And I, <laughs> so I went home and went, holy crap, that's a lot of wine. What was I doing? And she said, I was just in denial and ignore. And it's what my social group did. It's what my job demanded. And she said, I stopped all of it and started losing weight because we had to wait, wait like four to six weeks to get all our lab work back. And she's like, yeah, I'm like down like 10 pounds. I'm like, imagine that. (laughs) And it goes back to what we were saying. You mentioned perimenopause at the beginning. This is what served you in your twenties and thirties And even early forties is very different than when the wheels kind of start shifting on the car in our later forties and reverse puberty. Yeah. And I am the same. I am trying to embrace it wholeheartedly and enjoy it for what it is and really age with good intention and own it. I'm trying to own all the things and just rock out 50 when I get there, but I can't do the things I did even at 40. And I just had to accept that. And so you go, wham, wham, poor me for a second and then you get over it. Yeah. Or you don't. And you keep, I mean, it's the same thing with folks online. They're like, I'm doing everything and it's not working. What do I do now? And I'm like, fuck if I know I'm not your doctor. (laughs) 
and I don't care. I'm not here to sort out your hormonal issues for you, but I'm going to probably put my finger by looking at your profile picture. I'm going to put my finger on your hormones and I'm going to say all the other things that we have just covered in this episode. So I say that with love, but this episode is dedicated to all those people because it's all the things. And it goes back to adequate muscle mass, good sleep, good, you know, like you said, how could we phrase that better? But just that, well, metabolic flexibility, just having that nice ability to respond to that glucose surge. Cause to put it in, in graphics, when it happens on the glucose monitor, I see it go up and then I watch it drop. I'm like, oh, there's my insulin. And then I'll get a second little hump yep. because there's where the blood sugar actually, like the insulin did its job and drove it down. And if I ate something really terrible or I haven't been sleeping or whatever it is, that will be much more extreme and not so nice of a second hump. It's like yeah. another giant spike because my insulin just did, couldn't do the job. But 90, what last, the last data that I looked at, 94% of Americans have busted metabolism. So only 6% of us are walking around with insulin sensitivity. Yeah. And so I read that- on the, the NIH, what website it's right on the front of their website. I have it somewhere. 24% of America, adult Americans have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. 24%. It's either the NIH or it's the CDC. One of, one of them right on there. When you look it up, 24% non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So what that means is fatty liver, not due to alcohol, but diet glucose insulin inflammation. <laughs> when did you not see elevated liver enzymes on labs? Cause I saw them, I mean, I saw them all the time to yeah. some degree. And if you look at degree. them in correlation with the other markers on the labs, it was like, everybody had metabolic dysfunction. Yeah. Pretty much and everyone who walked in my thing, office. The insulin marker for, if you've, if anyone's ever had their fasting insulin drawn the range generally, and for most blood labs is under 24, under 24 is considered normal. But we know in functional, in functional naturopathic integrative, whatever medicine, we want it much lower. So there's a study that I found, I want to say last year, where they were looking at 104 people and in 104 people, they were looking to see what level was, it was insulin when somebody had a really high risk for metabolic syndrome, which increases your risk for cardiovascular disease and diabetes and all this stuff. I have the study right here in because <laughs> I was looking at it last night. Okay. Let's see here. This is a 2000... 18 study, 104 people. Okay. After adjusting for gender, age, body mass index, smoking status, hypertension, and dyslipidemia. So cholesterol, triglyceride issues, the middle-aged and elderly population in the high fasting insulin group were at a significant risk for developing metabolic syndrome. What did the study considered high insulin? Anything over 7.9. Now remember the range is under the normal range is under 24. And this study said, if you were over 7.9, you were considered high risk for metabolic syndrome. And then the moderate risk were people who were like 4.9 to 7.8. So you will often see in our medicine, people say your fasting insulin should be under five or two to four. And that's why we're trying to prevent cardiovascular disease. We're trying to prevent metabolic syndrome in you. And so I hate, it makes me so mad when the, when I see more conventional folk on social media, like, well, the range is to 24, you're being ridiculous and dramatic and don't follow the naturopath. And I'm like, it's in the study. It's literally in the study that I didn't do. Like your people did you, your traditional people did in, in 2018. And they said, if your insulin is under over 7.9, you're kind of screwed. You got really high risk. So why would I wait till you get to 25 And then be like, oh, you have a problem. I'm going to be like, well, the study said anything over really high risk over 7.9. So let's do something about it. And so that's what makes me, I'm like, prevent, like prevention. Come on now. I don't think they get it. I don't think it's, yeah, it's, they don't look, they don't, as we've seen through this pandemic, doctors are not looking very hard for death. (laughs) They're relying on what the CDC is feeding them every night. And they're not actually going in and reading studies to show what objective information is out there, but yeah, two to five, that's huge fasting insulin. And what happens to your hormones when your insulin's all screwed up and you have insulin resistance? Oh my gosh. They're a mess as well. Like forget them. And people come to me and they're like, well, I'm not ovulating or my testosterone's low or my cortisol's this. I feel terrible. We get their insulin back and it's 16. I'm like, let's start there. (laughs) Yes. And you know, or God forbid it's 32. It's like, it's truly is outside the range. Then I'm like, Whoa, 
stranger yeah. danger. We need to do something about this. And insulin's pro grow, meaning we want it when we lift weights, we want that insulin surge so that we can build muscle, but it is also pro grow for cancer. Yeah. So it is, in my opinion, cancer is a metabolic disease at its core and a lot of people's opinion and insulin is a friend or major foe. And I think it's a major foe. And I'd love to run insulin study. I would love to see fasting insulin on those who had the most severe outcomes with COVID because I guarantee it was a factor, but going you know, into COVID coming out of COVID or both probably both. Cause I mean, yeah. basically everybody who's, I shouldn't say everybody, I, I take that back because I have, I follow some of these long COVID sites and there are people who were relatively looking and I can tell, I can just look at somebody and be like, eh, your metabolism's jacked, <laughs> but I don't mean any disrespect. It's just a yeah. glance. Like I can just tell by the tissue integrity of their yeah. skin, but uh, there, so there are people who look healthy, who have been struck with long COVID, but generally speaking in the studies are supporting this, that those who are the highest propensity for long COVID are also the same people who have the highest propensity for yeah. poor outcomes with the virus. So like, if you go into it, inflamed, obese, blood sugar dysregulation, poor metabolic health, insulin resistance, the chance, like I keep saying, like how you enter in is going to dictate how you get through and come out the other side. Virtual side. Now I had to, like I was saying before we went live, I don't watch the news hardly ever, but I happened to be watching last night because I wanted at the time of us recording this, Hurricane Ian was hitting Florida and we had friends in Florida. So I was trying to see what was going on just from a news standpoint, even though all of social media was like way ahead of the news. So I should have just stuck with social media. But anyway, all the commercials for our area talking about shots and boosters mentioned that like, if you have high blood pressure, if you have high blood sugar, if all these things, you're at a higher risk. For, now their argument, you're at a higher risk for COVID. So get the booster. But I was yeah. like, well, look at that. Look at that. All the things that Tina was telling people to get under control at the beginning. Now they're finally admitting like these are your outcomes are going to be bad. They're what to do is to get the booster. But I was like, oh, I feel like I should record this. <laughs> <laughs> there was a study that just came out showing that in the double and triple vaccinated, those who entered into COVID, because everyone's going to get COVID, everyone who entered into COVID infection got sicker, had it for longer, higher rates of hospitalization, had higher viral titers, carried higher viral titers for a longer period of time. So therefore were more infectious. So that goes back to the same thing I was saying in the beginning, which is if your metabolic health is busted, you are going to, all of those things will be true. Well, it turns out it's also true if you're highly vaccinated as well. Yeah. And so it doesn't matter at the end of the day, you still got to get your metabolic health in order. Yeah. No matter about. which angle you chose or come from. I mean, even just, again, this microbiome conference that I was at, they talked about just either, either the virus or the vaccine. It didn't matter. Like if it's going to affect your microbiome, like everything's tied together again, spider webs. So we're talking about insulin and you might be thinking to yourself, oh, that's only diet. But a lot of things internally, like if you have gut issues, so chronic inflammation, chronic inflammation worsens insulin resistance. Like it's, you can come at it from multiple angles. And so you might've come into COVID with normal insulin levels, but if it, as we know, the virus, also, a lot of people, br brain fog is a top symptom, but GI symptoms, strangely enough, was another like common symptom. I came out with whatever, more gas, more bloating. And I can't tolerate as many foods. My heart burns bad again. Like, I don't understand why my gut integrity is bad. They don't use those words, but we do. And, but so they're just siloing. Oh, it's, I, it's gut. I must, I have IBS now. What the heck? But that can then just further, like that's more fuel to the fire, which can cycle back and worsen insulin resistance, therefore drive your insulin and blood sugar up. And so you have to be diligent that, and you have to be diligent now. You can't stop. The, bot, the human body, I say this in results to detox, but the human body is 24 seven, 365. Like the human body does not stop for Sunday, Christmas, Hanukkah, your birthday, nothing. The human body is 24 seven, 365. So yeah, we have to 24 seven, 365 our approach. I love it. I think that's a good place to close because it sums <laughs> it up beautifully. Where can everyone find you, Dr. Carrie Jones? Besides, you guys all have to follow her Instagram, by the way. I'm just going <laughs> to plug that because she is the queen over there. But where else can they find you and your yeah, beautiful so I'm, brain? I'm at, on Instagram, I'm at dr.carriejones. I am dabbling into TikTok. Wish me luck. Same handle, dr.carriejones. And then my website is drcarriejones.com. If you are a practitioner and you are interested in lab portals, uh, one portal to rule them all. Rupahealth.com and all my education there. 
Awesome. I will put them all in the show notes. And I'm so grateful always for your insight and your beautiful, beautiful brain. You always bring it together so well. And I love all your analogies, even if they are dramatic. <laughs> it helps. Yes. I would love to bring you back in, a, I don't know, say six months. And let's see how winter and spring is going to do. Yes. I'm here for it. Thank you yeah. so much for having me. I adore your face. So this is fun. Yes. I adore you too. Thank you, lady. <laughs>